So hi. I've been working on uh, typographic and layout systems for almost exactly as long as the web has existed. But I never really did much with the web uh, because it really wasn't that typographically interesting to begin with. Um, but that changed in 2011 when I was invited to give a talk, an internal talk, about what the web was lacking typographically. And so I put a few examples together and talked about hyphenation and justification, um, the inability to align things like drop caps to baselines, a related thing, not being able to use a baseline grid. Uh, it's nice to be able to have things align as in the bottom uh, picture here when you have side-by-side -side content. And uh, wrapping content around contours, around shapes that aren't rectangles. Um, so this presentation was fairly well received, and what I didn't realize when I was putting it together was it was a trap. After I gave the presentation, immediately after I got off the stage, I was approached by someone I had just met that day who said, all right then, you're going to join the CSS Working Group, and you're going to get all this stuff done. So I did. Uh, I, I joined the mailing list and started trying to figure out the weird language that people use to write specifications. Uh, I joined the CSS Working Group and tried to figure out how to get things like shapes uh, done in browsers. And uh, some of it's worked. Some of it hasn't. I've made some progress on some things. Uh, but just last month, I was appointed uh, the co-chair of the working group. So now I control the future of CSS. <laughs> Actually, it means that I'm the guy that makes sure that somebody's taking notes when we meet <laughs> and when we discuss things that everybody's voices get a chance to be heard. And what I want to do is make sure that when we talk about everybody's voices are heard, it's everybody. It's everybody using CSS and the web. It's all of you people out here. So I'm here today to ask for your help in figuring out what the future of CSS should be and what we should prioritize on. And I have uh, three things that I'm going to talk about that you can do to help us out. You don't all have to follow my path. You don't have to join the CSS Working Group. You don't even have to join the fire hose of www.style. Um, the first thing is just to write, speak, and share about what it is that you're working on. All of you use CSS. All of you have problems that you run across. All of you have solutions that you've come up with for the problems that you found. Um, when I first started looking at typography on the web, uh, web fonts were just becoming a thing. And so people were downloading web fonts, putting them on their pages, using them in headlines, and they didn't include the bold version of the font. So the browser would go and smear the glyphs around and make it look kind of bolder. Or if it was a fake italic, they'd slant the glyphs over. And to my eye, this just ruined everything. And so I'd find pages like this. One of them was uh, the Bootstrap homepage. And I'd go find the contact information for that site and message the people saying, hey, your site looks terrible. Take a look at it in Firefox. Here's how you can fix it. You, know, you can either download the bold, you can either put the bold font onto the page as well, or if the web font doesn't have a bold face and you want to use it in a headline, here's a fix for uh, this particular problem. This worked pretty well for the sites that I had visited and I could find some contact information for. The bootstrap people fixed it right away. Uh, some other sites fixed things, but it didn't, this solution for fixing problems on the web 
didn't really scale all that well. So uh, I wrote an article and had it published on the list apart saying, you know, here's a problem, here's the solution that I found for it. And this worked a lot better. Uh, got a lot more reach, got a lot more people fixing these problems, and I saw fewer of these sites. Um, but one thing happened that I didn't expect. One of the first comments on my article was someone who had written a very similar article and who had come up with a different solution that was better than mine. So just the fact of my writing up the problem, writing up my solution, I was gifted a better solution to uh, the problem that had been vexing me. And I hear this all the time with people who have written articles, who have stood up on stage. Um, there's value in organizing your thoughts and presenting it to people, but the connections that you make by doing so are, the, are even more valuable than getting the word out. And Rachel Andrew has uh, an article uh, she just published on Elizabeth Bart yesterday that talks about some of the value of this. Um, what she didn't say is that her writing articles about grid over the past few years has improved the specification work for grid immensely. The first module level of grid layout is going to be immensely better because Rachel has been experimenting with it writing about her findings, and the people writing the specification have found that immensely useful. But it doesn't have to be as public as a blog post or getting up on stage. Um, there, we've actually, in the CSS Working Group, have taken input from Twitter conversations. Uh, any way that you find to share what it is that you're doing is going to help us. It gives us more to work with more ideas about what to prioritize, what problems people are actually having. Um, so get the word out about what it is that you're doing, and it will help me. But there's also, if you have a future idea, uh, there's a, a board called discoursewicg.io that's been set up for the W3C, where you don't have to join the mailing lists, you don't have to figure out the right venue for your idea. If you just have an idea for the future of the web, you can go there, search to see if anybody has a similar idea, and if not, post it. And people with, all, with connections to all sorts of uh, specifications on web technology will uh, give your idea a chance, let you know why it's terrible, or find a way of getting it through the specification process. So the second thing that you can do to help us out is to shout when things go wrong. If you find a browser incompatibility, write a bug for the browser that's doing it wrong. It's the only way they will learn. Um, and the best way to write a bug for a browser is to give them a W3C style test for it. W3C test formats are designed to run in every browser. So if you can show a problem with a W3C test, the browser engineer will be able to run it in their browser and see the difference from what it should be, and be able to run it in other browsers to see if anybody else is getting any better at it. Um, we used to run a series of events called Test the Web Forward, where we would show people how to write these W3C tests and how to write bugs in browsers. We don't run them anymore because they were pretty expensive to put together. But because we ran so many of them, we put this site together with documentation on how to run these things, how to teach people how to write tests, where bugs get logged for browsers and all this, so there are resources here. If any of you are, like me, more interested in writing test code than production code, this is the place that will tell you how to write W3C tests, how to write a bug for each browser, and where to go for the resources that you need to do all of this stuff. And if any of you are interested in this sort of thing, 
I'm very happy to do a one-on-one -on -one test the web forward to help you figure out how to do all of these things. But um, one thing you may not know is that browser bugs are not just about incompatibilities, problems with the browsers. They also use them for tracking future feature work. So for instance, um, CSS shapes, one of the specifications I work on, isn't implemented in all the browsers. But the browsers it's not implemented in have bugs saying, hey, we should implement CSS shapes. And what you can do if you're interested in a future thing that has not been implemented yet is go find the bug that says, hey, we should implement this and add your vote to it, add a plus one. You might not think that that would be terribly useful, but it unfortunately is. Um, we had a conversation just a month ago where there's a type of selector that we've known people have wanted for at least a decade. And everyone in the, in the working group was going around the table going, yes, yeah, we understand, we need to have that. Um, but one of the browser engineers was looking at their bug base and said, basically, yes, I understand, we need to have this, everybody wants it, but our bug only has three votes. And there was that, there was that dissonance where he understood the need for it, he couldn't prioritize it because there were other bugs in his bug base with lots more votes. So if there's something that you would like to see browsers implement and you're impatiently waiting for them to get around to it, it can help to go to the browsers and vote for the thing that you like. I encourage you all, if you're interested in CSS shapes, to go vote for CSS shapes bugs. And the last thing is that you can help us explain the magic of CSS. I understand that at least half of you here are uh, very interested in JavaScript, maybe even do more JavaScript work than CSS. Um, we have a task force now called Houdini that is about escaping the magic of CSS. Houdini was a magician who escaped out of boxes, but he was also a debunker of magicians. So psychics or magicians who said that what they were doing was real, he would go and pull back the curtain and show what the trick was. In CSS, there's a lot of behind the curtain magic. You have styles and markup that go in, and you have layouts that come out and there's a black box in the middle that you don't get access to. What we are trying to do in Houdini is open up that black box, make it so that you can replace or enhance what's some of the machinery in that black box with JavaScript. I've been involved in a number of uh, polyfills for future features like CSS shapes, where we've tried to make it so that you can code for the new browser and still have the feature work in older browsers that don't implement it. And we found that it's just way too hard. Um, there's all this machinery that you have to duplicate. You basically have to write a CSS parser of your own in JavaScript that has to run at all the different places that CSS, the CSS parser in the browser is running. And that's something that you can approximate, but not really do in a rigorous way. Um, and it's all stuff that the browser is doing already anyway. There should just be hooks to say, well, if you're going to parse your CSS, I want to know about this and that and the other thing. So the Houdini Task Force is working on uh, CSS parsing, uh, coming up with a typed object model so that if you have JavaScript that is dealing with styles, you don't have to serialize and deserialize all these string values. You just get the value itself. Um, there, there, was a, there was a Chrome uh, 
polyfill that they were trying to create, and they did a little bit of measurement, and they found that the polyfill was spending 20% of its time just dealing with string values in the CSS. Um, eventually, Houdini is going to get to the box model, where you can find the boxes that your elements and style are creating on the display tree, um, and get to things like custom paint, so that if you want to have something going on in your background that is programmatically generated, you have a way of hooking up your JavaScript to the display code and have your JavaScript do the drawing for you. And all of this is not to replace styles with JavaScript. It's to allow experimentation so that instead of waiting for a browser to implement a new feature, we can give people the hooks to implement a new feature in JavaScript and see whether it takes off. If there's something that is using the Houdini hooks uh, that people really like, that people start using a lot, that gives us a really good indication that it's something that we should add to CSS proper and allow the browsers to optim optimize the performance of it. So if you're interested in JavaScript, Please take a look at Houdini. We have a GitHub repository with some of the specs. Um, it's just, it can be as easy as opening an issue in GitHub saying, I don't understand why you would use this bit or this part of the specification needs to be added to so that I will have the hooks that I need for my own thing. So it will help me determine the future of CSS. If you can speak up about your experiences, if you can shout out about the things that are going wrong as you find them, and if you can help us script our way to a better CSS. Thank you. <laughs>